the largest entertainment industry today, valued at around $2 billion, almost did not exist after suffering a huge recession in the early 1980s, losing at the time roughly 97% of sales almost overnight. Join us this week as we look at the video game crash of 1983. Games. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's what we're looking at. Games. 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 I like my video games. Welcome, everybody, to Cheeky Tales this week. Uh, I believe this is episode 47. It is episode 47. Coming we're nearing up, in on the half ton. Yeah, coming up on 50 or 52, which would normally be a year for a weekly podcast, but that would be two years for us. Is 47 the meaning of life number from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? I believe it is, yeah. Ooh. Is it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, fact they go, check. They go, what's the meaning of life? And someone's just like, 47. Yeah. Mm. And it's in the book. Little bit. The reason Hello, it's, Apollo. The reason it's 47 is something to do with 40, like it, in the book, it's 47 is the numerical value of the asterisk, asterisk yeah. key, which of course means it's it variable. It means anything. So, uh, the meaning of life is anything, anything or everything. Well. Thank you for spoiling that movie. Who have we got oh, it's this 42. week? It's 42. It's 42. Uh, I'm your host. It's me, John. Hello, I'm Aaron, the, the question guy. The everyman. Mm. And yeah. joining us again, producer extraordinaire, Sheen. Nice, nice Sean. padding while he got his mic ready. <laughs> Sheen. Good power play. Good power. <laughs> my, my brother-in-law has done that so many times. He has known my name longer than Rachel and I, my wife, have been together. And when he introduced me to his new girlfriend, he goes, hey, this is, uh, this is my bro- brother-in-law, Shane. I'm like, sure. He goes, oh, sorry, mate. I'm like, oh, he'd known me for like four years at that point. <laughs> Great move. Now we know that that gets him. Yeah. That's every, every episode's a new name. So how have we all been? It's been a uh, few more weeks since we've last recorded. It has been two weeks since we recorded. Yes. Actually, no, it hasn't. It's been it's three. Been three. Four? Three. It's been a while. Yeah. Mm. I'm good. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Last episode was good. Um, I thought it was great. Tracking well. I've told mm. many people about the uh, inspiration for Moby Dick. Moby Dick. Yeah, that one got a couple of good listens with the boys in the band. They were a big I fan. I do one. keep reading the title as the itchy episode of the Essex. Yeah, I saw that too. <laughs> the itchy episode. Uh, Fact check. Fact check number one for oh, the day. Oh, here we go. Icky's not spelled not like how you that. spell Icky. It's I-C-K-Y, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Or I-C-K-I after, I believe, the character in the Jungle Book. I would like it to be known that I'm never editing the title. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Before we get into it, uh, hit us up on at Cheeky Tales Pod on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Yep. Uh, we post supplemental information there. It might help with some imagery that you don't quite get in your head. Uh, and also you can have a chat to us. Let us know what you like. Let us know what you don't like. Uh, keep that to yourself, actually. Just tell us what you love. Uh, we're very vain. Um, John cries if he gets negative feedback. I do. Uh, I sulk for in three weeks. In the shower. Yeah. Cry in the shower. Never leave the shower. No one can never see, see my tears crying. then. Mm. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, join us there and share us if you would like to. I'm not going to force you, but I will be disappointed if you don't. So this, this week we're talking about video Games. Games. Video games. Uh, Video games make you violent. People listening, if you know me, uh, you know I'm a bit of a gamer. Are you? A little bit. I've never known that about you. No, I like my video games. Video games. Uh, And since we've started this podcast, I've always kind of been on the lookout for a story centered centered around video games, like, you know, maybe ones around the industry, ones about maybe a specific game itself or in a game, like there's still... I believe there's still an ongoing mystery in one GTA 5 that people haven't sold yet, like the UFO in the mountain. That's a thing? I th- believe it is, yeah. Yeah, first I've heard of that. Mm. Okay. Well, it was a thing when it first came out. I don't know if people are still trying to solve it, but who knows. Damn. Um, oh. So the reason why I've chosen this week to do it um, is because we've just had a very popular and a very good game made into a very popular and very good TV show. Yep. The Last of Us. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. I thought what you were we- talking about the video game of The Walking Dead. That got made into a game, didn't it? Ages ago? That was a show. Don't that was a show that got first. turned into a game. This is a yeah. game that got turned, turned into, into a, show. a show. And it's so, I'm not going to say good because I haven't seen it, but so 
I have popular seen and so prevalent. Yeah. It is like the talking point at the moment. Like, mm. well, oh, it's died off now. I well, think the first two or three episodes, everyone was like, Bleh! also having Pedro Pascal oh, he was, the microphone. Yeah, very hot at the moment. Yeah, he's he's right on because he had Mandalorian come out, then Wonder Woman. He was the yes. pr- protagonist. In, uh, antagonist uh, in, in 1984. Wonder yes, yep. yes, yes. And then you just have to like pull back a little bit. Yeah, I know. I'm, I keep burping. Yeah, Not only the first, uh, Game of Thrones, Mandalorian season. Oh, was he in Game of Thrones? Yeah, he was um, one, the Sands guy that gets his head popped by the mountain. Oh, Ugh. okay. See, I haven't seen any of Game of Thrones. Okay, so he's in, he was in Game of Thrones, Mandalorian okay. season one and two, in the book of Boba Fett, so he's in Star Wars. Yes. Is Mandalorian season three? Just yes, M- Mandalorian season three is happening right now. Oh, it's being released now. Yeah, it's, but it's, uh, still, it's a weekly it's episode. Weekly, yes. Ah, you see, but nobody cares now. So we've out had, of the news. I have to wait until it all comes out. And yes, you got the role of Joel in The Last of Us, which, yeah. um, have you played the game? No, because- Aaron, have you played the game? I've played the first 20 seconds. Okay. About the time that became popular was when I- 2013 or at least. So I got a PlayStation. On the PS3. Mm. Oh, it was released on PlayStation 3. Yes, and then they released a remaster on the PS4, and now they've just released a remake on the PS5. Ah, okay. A- around the time that I think this was coming out, I started switching back to Xbox okay. and leaving the, the PlayStation 4 alone. So that would have been why I didn't play it. I have managed to play it because I borrowed Aaron's PS4 and I played it. <laughs> but yeah, no, a- excellent game. I th- and the really cool thing about this is now that a lot of people who will never, ever pick up a controller get to experience this story. Mm. This is a, it's an amazing story um, of not just, it's not a zombie show. Well, it is a zombie show, but it's, that's not what it's about. It's about the relationship between the two characters, Joel and Ellie, about what people do to each other in these extreme situations and the journey they go on. So mm-hmm. I do recommend isn't it. eating each other on a boat. Just icky warning out of the way. <laughs> no one's no. eating each other on a boat. There's a lot less ick in this week's episode. Yeah, pretty much. Um, but yeah, so if you haven't seen it, I recommend watching it. Um, uh, if you're a father, be prepared to cry in the first episode because I did. Uh, I did in the game as well within the first half hour. So there's a warning. But yeah, that's what that's the reason why I chose to do video games. So let's have a look at how video games started. Pong. Uh, there's actually a little bit before we get to Pong, but you're yeah, correct. There is? Yeah. So during the 1950s, computer scientists were using mainframe computers to construct relatively simple games, such That's as actually when they first released GTA V <laughs> <laughs> and Skyrim. <laughs> yeah, initial release of and, Skyrim and, and Rust. <laughs> yeah, and Minecraft. Minecraft. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not many people are going to get these jokes <laughs> this week if you're not yeah. a gamer. Yeah, anyone that's ever played a video game before and hears us making fun of that will immediately be like, "Yes." So, yeah, very simple games on these mainframe. When I say mainframe mainframe computer, you know what I mean, right? Like yep. the big old school. Big room full yeah, tapes running to each running, other. Yep. Yep. So, Bertie the Brain nice. was like the first one. And um, Bertie would play tic-tac-toe. Okay. Uh, and they also had Nimrod and Nimrod would play Nim. Okay. Do you know what Nim is? Not a clue. Sean, can you fact check this, please? I believe Nim is a like- pyramid type setup of matchsticks and you would have turns removing a certain amount of matchsticks and the person who removed the last matchstick lost type of thing. It is indeed a mathematical game of strategy in which two players take turns removing or nimming objects from distinct heaps or piles. Mm -hmm. Uh, On each turn, a player must remove at least one object and may remove any number of objects provided they all come from the same heap or pile. Depending on the version being played, the game of the goal is to either avoid taking the last object or to take the last object. Variants of Nim have been played since ancient times. It says mm. to have originated in ancient China. Yeah, so these are computers playing like, I guess like, oh, what would you class them? Just like normal, not they're not carnival games, but just like whatever. They're playing not, traditional puzzle games. Puzzle they're, games, yeah. yeah. They're, not, they're not so much video games. The first recognized video game is considered to be Space War. Okay. It was developed in 1961 for the PDP-1, a mainframe computer at MIT. Space War, I'm going to say it like that because there's an like exclamation mark at the end of it, would allow two players to simulate a space combat fight on the PDP, PDP-1's simplistic monitor. The game's source code was shared with other institutions across the country as the MIT students like moved about between um, campuses, allowing the game to gain popularity. 
Into the 1970s, more games for mainframe computers were made, but the displays on these were the limiting factor. Mm. So it wasn't so much the power of the computer, it was how it was displayed. So games were focused more on puzzle solving rather than straight up action. Notable games of the time included the tactical combat game Star Trek, 1971, the hide and seek game, Hunt the Wampus, 1972 (laughs) by Gregory Yobb. I specifically included that one because I knew you'd love it. Hunt the Wampus. Hunt the Wampus. Get your Wampus here. Wampus, $3 a kilo. (laughs) I looked it up. It was specifically like circles representing caves and you had to like find this little monster, the the Wampus. The Wampus. Yep. It has a name. The Wampus. (laughs) And the strategic war game Empire in 1977 created by Walter Bright, who drew his inspiration from board games like Battle of Britain and Risk. And one of the... Most notable games, Colossal Cave Adventure, or simply Adventure, created in 1976 by Will Crother by combining his passion for cave caving, which is uh, spelunking, like cave diving, yes, cave exploring, bada boom, with the concepts of the newly released tabletop role playing game Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, well, there you go. And high fantasy concepts made popular by one J.R.R. Tolkien. So, lots of what we consider these days pop culture stuff was inspiration for these early video games. And it's just really weird when I was typing this up, like all these things were new. <laughs> yeah, it's like, like the first time. Yeah, Star Trek was new. Um, oh, Tolkien had been around for a while, but like yeah, Dungeons and Dragons had just been released. And you think like- Is that our second Tolkien reference in three episodes? Uh, what was the first one? Christopher Lee. Yeah, Christopher oh, yeah. Lee. Yeah, it would be. So during the late 60s and the early 70s, arcades were experiencing- like the arc- arcades mm-hmm. were experiencing a technical technological renaissance. Now, these aren't the arcade machines we know today. Okay. I do love Point Blank. No, not like that, boy. These were more of the skill tester type games. Oh, okay. So, like, oh, how fast are your reactions? Oh, can yeah, you punch how this fa- thing? Yep. So, machines like the, the basketball one with the two players. And you oh, yeah. Get it in and, yep. Claw machine. Hmm. Um, like you said, the I guess like maybe punching bags and stuff or throwing the ball into the- Yeah. Yep. Ski ball. Yep. You know what's just occurred to me? Ski ball probably existed before electronics. Probably. <laughs> One such game was Sega's 1966 game, Periscope. Okay. I'm guessing this has something to do with submarines. Oh boy. You are on fire. Uh, Am per- I? Put me per- out. Periscope task players- by shooting torpedoes at cardboard ships while looking through a periscope. Okay. Nice. Uh, I believe it was five torpedoes and- You sunk my battleship. Yeah. A college student at that time by the name of Nolan Bushnell worked in one of these arcades where he would become familiar with EM games, which is short for electronic machine games. Okay. Watching consu- like customers or consumers play and uh, he would help maintain the machinery. Meanwhile, Ralph Bier, B-A-E-R, so Bier, 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 Ralph, he would, uh, while working for a defense contractor, he came up with the idea for an entertainment device that would be hooked up to a television monitor. He presented this idea to his superiors and they refined the concept into the brown box prototype that would play a simple table tennis game. They patented the technology and sold the license to Magnavox to commercialize. With Bear's help, Magnavox developed the Magnavox Odyssey, the commercial home console in 1972. That's considered to be the first home console. Home console. 1972. Okay. Which is what, 50 years ago, 51 years ago. Yeah. As of recording. There you go. Back to Bushnell. While this, like, while the Magnavox stuff was happening, he and Ted Dabney had the idea of making a coin operated system to run Space War. By 1971, the two had developed Computer Space with Nutting Associates. That was their- Great name. Nutting um, Associates. Business name, yep. This is considered to be the first arcade video game. Bushnell and Dabney struck out on their own and formed a company called Atari. Inspired Ah. by the table tennis game on the Odyssey, they hired Alan Alcorn to develop an arcade first of the game. What? Why did that don't make sense? I don't know what I was trying to write there. Bushnell, inspired by the table tennis game of the Odyssey, hired Alan Alcorn to develop an arcade version of the uh, arcade 
arcade yeah, for, arcade version of the game. I think I meant to write version sort of first. Ah, uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. An arcade version Sounds of the game. like somebody's using <laughs> Wikipedia. Yeah. Well, I couldn't rewrite that one. That was straight out of there. Atari's Pong was released in 1970, late 1972 and considered to be the first successful arcade video game. So we got Atari, we got Pong. Yeah, so- And what Pong, is it? 1972. 1972 is the uh, so arcade little, release of Pong. Little Billy Flipper Gibbons is opening up his Pong machine Christmas yep. morning, 1972. Nope. Oh. This is like machines released into arcade. Oh, didn't you say they buildings. released a home console? Yeah, that was Magnavox with the Odyssey. Right. So he's opening his Odyssey. Yep. Thank you, Daddy. Does it have games? It does. Hmm. Uh, can you have a look what games were on what the Magnavox? What games released Odyssey? on the Magnavox? The Magnavox Odyssey is the first commercial home video game console. The hardware was designed by a small team led by Ralph H. Bayer and Sanders Associates, while Magnavox completed development and released it in the United States in 1972. Overseas the following year, they'll see consist of a white, bland, and black box. Yeah, what games are on it? Two panels on a mic. Wow. What is that noise? The cat? Wow, that is loud. What is he scratching? I don't know. That's unbelievable. Oh, it's the door behind me. Games. Table tennis. Ski. One player moves a dot representing a skier back and forth as they go down a mountain path. Dope. Included on console, mind you. Now with some- graphics. Now with graphics. Uh, Simon <laughs> says, a three-player game where two players must race to touch the body part of their chosen character's picture. Well, that seems third- dangerous. When the third player tells them to, based on a deck of Simon Says cards. <laughs> tennis, not just table tennis, but tennis itself. Two players use paddles to knock a ball back and forth on the screen, uses an overlay of a tennis court, and the players are intended to follow the rules of tennis. How did we get butt 19 times in a row? Analogic, a math game where players can move to either square depicted on the overlay based on if the number of the square is odd or even and the sum of the other oh. players move. Oh, man, that's-, that's Why do these games sound so niche and awkward? Hockey. Because that's all that you could do at the time. Hockey and football. Two players use paddles to knock a ball back and forth on a screen. Uses <laughs> an overlay of a hockey link. Hockey. So it's bong with an overlay. It's overhead. I'm we're- feeling a lot of rebranding of existing we're content. Gonna, we're going to get to pong in a minute. Oh, so football. The, the, this success of Pong in the arcades ignited the growth in the arcade game industry from both established coin-operated game manufacturers like Williams, Chicago Coin, and Midway. Do you, yep. re- do you recognize Midway? I recognize the name. That is still a gaming company going on today, oh. as well as new startups like Ramtech and Allied Leisure. Ramtech. Many of these new games were Pong clones. And it led to market saturation in 1974, forcing arcade game makers to innovate. I did quickly see a screen of, like I tried looking up Pong clones and there was like a lot, all yeah. different names like, you know, tennis, tennis table hockey. tennis, hockey, but it was stuff like um, ball beat or something like that. Mm. Just stupid names. And there was a, a lot. Downbeat. I'm also stuck at allied leisure. Like, that just sounds like the most oh, awkward so company to work for. Where do you work? Oh. Allied Leisure. <laughs> it's probably called Allied Leisure, not Allied Leisure. Allied Leisure. It does sound bad, doesn't it? Yeah. Many of the new game companies couldn't innovate and were forced to shut down by the end of 1975. Of course, they couldn't innovate. They were making the same yeah. game. <laughs> that was the problem. I know that there's 3,500 Pong remakes, but what if we made a Pong remake? That's, yeah. that's literally what was happening. Except this one's called Volleyball. <laughs> and you see which the was background. Also, which was also on the Magnavox, yep. yeah. And by the end of 1975, <laughs> the arcade market had fallen about 50% based on new game sales revenue. Further to that, Magnavox took Atari and several others to court over violations of Bear's patents. Atari would settle out of court and pay licensing fees to be able to continue selling Pong. Other companies would fail to settle and Magnavox would be awarded around $100 million in damages. Wow. That doesn't seem like much, but I guess it's the 70s, so that's probably like $250 billion today. Yeah, so this is in the 70s. So, like I said, uh, Atari was paying licensing fees, which also allowed them, I read somewhere, that they were able to get the plans for the Magnavox and there was some sort of swapping of details there as well. Why would Magnavox agree to that? I don't know. Arcade video games would catch on quickly in Japan and the Nakamura Amusement Machine Manufacturing Company or Nameco, ah, oh, yeah. yes. partnered with Atari to import Pong into, the, into Japan in late 1973. 
Again, within the year, Taito and Sega released Pong clones. So now there's just like Pong clones happening yep. in Japan. The Magnavox Odyssey never caught on with the public, and that was because of its limited functionality. By mid-1975- What do you mean? It's got 45 Pong clones on <laughs> <laughs> By mid-1975, microchips had become cheap enough to start being incorporated into consumer products. So Magnavox made the Odyssey 100 and Odyssey 200. Atari, on the other hand, also entered the consumer market with the home Pong system. The next year, General Instruments released a Pong on a chip LSI, which is like, uh, I guess the simple way to do it. It's like a basic motherboard that had like Pong built on She's watching Blended again, isn't she? Is that Blended? What is it this time? Is it an Adam Sandler movie? 50 First Dates? Horrible Bosses. Big Daddy? Happy Gilmore. Click. Billy Madison. Murder Mystery with Jennifer Aniston. Murder Mystery 2 coming out of cinemas this Boxing Day. <laughs> Just go with it. Also with Jennifer Aniston. The other one with Drew Barrymore. <laughs> you know what? She could be watching. That's very appropriate. Are you watching Pixels? Oh, Funny been, people. That would have been perfect. Running out of Adam Sandler. Yeah, welcome to the Adam Sandler <laughs> section of the podcast. Big Daddy. Welcome I've already to, said yeah. it. You lose. Welcome to the Adam Sandler fan club, sponsored by Cheeky Tales. <laughs> so, yeah, General Instruments released that Pong on a chip LSI, like yep. as limited silicon, blah, 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 right? It's just a circuit board with like Pong built on it. Cool. And they made it a low cost to any interested company. Toy company Colco Industries used this chip to create the million selling Telstar console. Okay. Never heard of it? No. no, I've never heard of it either. These initial video games were very popular, which led to a large influx of companies releasing even more Pong clones, as well as other games, to satisfy customer or consumer demand. So to put it, to put, put it this in picture, boy, mm-hmm. all right? In 1975, there were seven companies releasing home consoles. When? 1975. 1975. Yep. By 1977... There were at least 82 companies with more than 160 different models released in that year alone. Wow. That's a lot of consoles to play Pong on. Yeah. Yes. Well, the Magnafox Odyssey 100 and the Odyssey 200 only played ball and paddle games. Yeah. No other types. Isn't, isn't there a whole episode of that 70s show where Kelso is just making Pong better? Yes. Yeah. That's how important Pong was yeah. to culture. So sales dropped in 1978. I wonder why. <laughs> Due to customer wariness and the introduction of handheld electronic games. Ah, uh, yeah. When you can play Pong on the go, why do you need a home Pong That's console? Right. <laughs> As popularity was By starting way, to wane- this is like three years straight of the whole world playing, playing Pong. Pong. Like, I can play that game for maybe five minutes before <laughs> I'm like, That's enough. I guess there was just nothing to do no. except play Pong and be a serial killer in the late 70s. Oh, so. geez. Play Pong, get beat by your dad, like just <laughs> real, like just everything that every boomer has ever told you about their childhood is all summed yeah. up in a couple of years of them playing Pong. Wow. As popularity started to wane in Feel the West- Feel free to cut that. <laughs> get beat by your dad. <laughs> dream about buying a house for $1,000. Oh, yeah. Dream about it now. As popularity was starting to wane in the West, it briefly surged into, in Japan- with television companies such as Toshiba and Sharp making their own consoles, as well as the first console made by one company still in the game industry today, Nintendo. They introduced Color TV Game Console in partnership with Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi? Mitsubishi. They also make my fridge. Air conditioners. It's got a 10-year warranty. Is that a Mitsubishi fridge? Yes. Oh. Yeah, they make aircons as well. Yeah. I'm Very also going to cut aircon. all Remember this. Aircons. Remember the aircons? With Ma- is Michael, Michael Slater. Ta- no, Michael Taylor. Taylor, not Michael Slater. Tubby Tails. That was Toshiba. No, it was no, absolutely Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi. Tubby Taylor. Yep. Fact checker. No, that Fact was Fujitsu. Che- oh, it is Fujitsu. Hang on. I'm going to leave the typing in, the aggressive typing. It was definitely Fujitsu with yeah, Tubby Yeah, yeah, it is Fujitsu, but there is, an, there is a Mitsubishi one, and it's, I think it's got a- a chef. I think the Mitsubishi stuff is mainly commercial now. Like I know a lot of refrigeration yeah. mechanics who they swear by Mitsubishi commercial. Or Mitsubishi Industries. Remember? Yes. Side note here, boys. Interesting history on Nintendo. You want to give me a guess of what year they were founded? I will not contribute. 
Who Nintendo? Yeah, because you know. As I'm currently yeah. looking at the it's, screen, it's like 1850 or something, isn't 1889. it? 1889. Yeah, because they started off making like I want to say razors or something. Nope. September 23rd, 1889. They played. Uh, they made Hannah F- Fuda card playing cards, which is like a Japanese type of playing card. Okay. Uh, they made it from 1889 to roughly 1949. Um, from 1949 to 1965, they continued making playing cards and had made a deal with Disney to use Disney characters on their cards. And then from 1966 to about 1972, they entered the toy making market with such toys as the Love Tester a, and a baseball throwing machine called Ultra Machine. Ultra Machine. And then, yeah, now, that, <laughs> now, we're, now we're back in 1972 with the Color TV game. The love tester was just like um, two like electrodes on the end of a machine and two yeah, people would it. hold it. Yeah. And it would give you like your percentage match or whatever. Mm. Yep. I would love to know what that's based on. It's probably just a random number generator. Yeah, Or probably it's like the a, sweatiness. It's, yeah. Just a measure of resistance and ohms. Yeah. Have a look up the Nintendo Ultra Machine though. It's a pretty cool looking machine. It's got like a little, almost like well, a- It is the Ultra Machine. Yeah. It's like a roller coaster track with the ball sit on it. It comes down into like a little hopper. Oh, my. Yeah, it's cool, eh? Oh, my. Are you looking it up as well, boy? Oh, my stars. There's a newer model called the Ultra Machine DX. Is there? Oh. They were using DX and all that back then? Like, because there was-, there was The a- Ultra Machine appears in both WarioWare Incorporated Mega yes. Micro Game for the they- Game Boy Advance. They WarioWare also- Smooth Moves for the Wii as a boss fight. Yeah. In the former and regular micro game in the latter. Yeah. It appears in some Mario Party games, such as Mario Party. Five. It also makes an appearance as a piece of furniture in Animal Crossing New Leaf 3DS. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Rusty's Real Deal Baseball. I believe they also made a vacuum cleaner that's in like a WarioWare game as well. It's in Splatoon 2. WarioWare has just about every piece of Nintendo history. In it. Yeah, okay. WarioWare is amazing. Is that where you know the playing card, like how to food, no. how to food are from? I just know things. Okay. That's why we have a podcast. Sure. I just thought that was, oh yeah, when I read that, like Nintendo was founded in 1889, I was like, huh? Yeah. They went through some name changes, like originally that was Nintendo playing card company, and then they went through some other ones, and then eventually around about that 1970, or just afterwards, they settled on Nintendo. Yeah, they started out as uh, Nintendo Karuta. Great name. After the ball and paddle market saturation of 1975, game developers started looking for new ideas. So it took them- Half a decade to yeah. look for new ideas. What do you reckon is, just from your game knowledge, what do you think the next big game is? Uh, Space Invaders? Nailed it. Space Invaders released in Japan in 1978, and it popularized several important concepts in arcade video games, such as play controlled by lives instead of time or like a set score, uh, gaining extra lives through gaining points, and tracking of high score on a leaderboard. It was also the first game to confront players with waves of targets that would shoot back, and the first to include background music, even though it was only a four-note loop. Huh. Space Invaders led off what is considered to be the golden age of arcade games, which lasted from 1978 to 1982. There are several influential and best-selling arcade games released during this period. They include, and you tell me which ones you recognise here, boy, Asteroids in 79. I have played that. Defender. An 80. I don't remember that one. Missile Command, also yes. an 80. I had that one on Game Boy. Tempest in 81. Yep. And Galaga in 81. Mm. Yep. The 1980 release of Pac-Man also became- Waka, 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 A or, pop culture icon. Originally called Puck-Man. Puck-Man, yeah. Puck-Man, Puck-Man. in Japan. Puck-Man, Puck-Man in Japan. <laughs> Sounds like a newsreader. Pac-Man. Waka, 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 waka. Pac-Man issued in, or Pac-Man ushered in a new <laughs> wave of games which had alternative mechanics, such as navigating a maze or navigating a series of platforms. So all those other games I mentioned before, like Asteroids, Defender, Tempest, Gallagher, they were all kind of like little ships that would move back and forth and shoot things. Yeah. Like very, very, again, very similar, but also yeah. very popular. By the way, that like water bubbling noise, that's us slurping from drinks. We've been doing it the whole night. <laughs> laughing at each other doing it. It's definitely not a bong. <laughs> I, didn't I, even, just, I didn't even make that connection. I just realised how much that bubbly sounds. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yep. Okay, I get you now. Yep. So, yeah, series of platforms. Uh, popular games with these mecha- mechanics. Mechanics. Mechanics include Donkey Kong, 
and Cubit. Donkey Kong. Do you know, do you know Cubit? Mm-hmm. Do you know do what you know, DK stands for? Do you know Cubit? Like I don't the know. Little, little round dude like a trumpet. Donkey Cubit, Kong. Yeah. Um, knows. Cubit. These games also introduced the concept of having narratives and characters in video games, which led to companies adopting them as mascots oh, for that marketing. Thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's Cubit. Yeah, right. For most people that might have never played it, you might recognize the character from Wreck It Ralph. Mm. Oh, he yeah. Wreck It Ralph. Yep. Around this time, revenue from coin operated arcades in the US jumped from $308 million in 1978 to $986 million in 79 to $2.8 billion in 1980. It's a lot of quarters. That's a lot, That's a lot, of, lot quarters. of quarters. A lot of quarters. Pac-Man released that year and ignited an even larger video game craze and revenues jumped to a further $4.9 billion in 1981. Waka waka what? Pac-Man. So yeah, we started at $308 million in 78 and by 81, we are at 4.9. So much. And by July 1982, the coin-op industry peaked at $8.9 billion, Peaked! Of which $7.7 billion was attributed to from video games. Yep. And yeah, like I said, this is, what did I say? It was 82 and we're talking about $9 billion. It's the same year that Pac-Man's divorced wife was released. Yes. Miss Pac-Man also <clears> came <throat> out. There was a Ms. Thing. Pac-Man. Oh, it's it's Ms. Pac-Man. Ms. Pac-Man. I don't know why. I don't know why they decided on Ms. Pac-Man. It's like, ah, <laughs> oh, yes, no. She's divorced. There um, is a She's a strong woman. Backstory to well, the man maybe family. Maybe it's just Pac-Man's sister. Ms. Pac-Man but released in 1982. Divorced. Ms. Pac-Man uh, released in 1982 is con- supposed to be controlling Pac-Man's wife. Okay. Are you Ms. if your partner passed away? No. You're still Mrs. Ms. Yeah. Ms. is purely a divorced name. Okay. Okay. That no one really uses. The amount of arcades, as in like the buildings, also doubled at this time, going from 10,000 to just over 25,000 mm. in the US. All these figures made arcade games the most popular entertainment medium in the US, surpassing music at $4 billion and Hollywood films at $3 billion. Surpassed music? Yes. Yeah. Wow. D- doubled it. Sheesh. Yeah. That was John's foot. That was loud. Yeah, it's very sweaty. <laughs> Sorry. Sweaty. Oh, so sweaty. So what about on the home front? Australia specifically? No, like as in the home console. Oh, we've been I talking say, about arcade we consoles for a little bit. Yeah, we were still we were still playing marbles. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, can I point out Townsville didn't even have television at this point? Yeah, yeah. Well, you weren't in Townsville at the time. Either. I know, but I, for some reason, I know about the Townsville TV tower coming around like the early eighties. Was the first time Townsville got yeah, television. Right. The eighties. It was late seventies, early eighties. The exact. I guess because there was probably only like thirty five people there. Yeah, so, so everybody <laughs> was just fishing and yeah, and running away from crocodiles. and running away from crocodiles. Yeah. So up until nineteen seventy six, consoles that were released pretty much only had like games built into them. Mm-hmm. So engineers set about finding some way they could load programs in from a form of swappable me- swappable media. This led to the Fairchild Channel F. F is short for fun. <laughs> this was the first console to use swappable rom rom car- car- You're doing good with words today. I am. This was the first console to use swappable ROM cartridges. Atari and Magnavox followed with their own systems, the Atari 2600 and the Odyssey 2. These were more expensive than the systems with dedicated games on board, so fewer manufacturers entered the market. This new line of home consoles had its breakout moment when Atari obtained the license from Taito to create the Atari 2600 version of the arcade hit Space Invaders, which was released in 1980. That release quadrupled sales of the Atari 2600 and it became the first ever game to sell over 1 million copies. Quadrupled sales. Quadrupled sales. Sheesh. And it would eventually sell over 2.5 million by 1981. Wow. Atari's consumer sales would almost double in 1980 from 119 million to 200 and 4 million, then explode in 1981 to 841 million. 841 yep. from what? 200? 204, yep. Yep. Sheesh. The entire video the entire home video game industry would follow the same pattern largely thank to thanks to Atari as it would have 65% of the market share as it continued to make home conversions of the popular arcade games. Mattel was second with 17%, Magnavox a distant third. And Fairchild was gone by 1979. Rip. Create the industry. Die. They were gone. Yep. So, yeah, just obviously, even back then in the early 80s, games were a thing. 
Don't scratch your nose at the microphone. It didn't make any noise this week. It absolutely did. I heard it the first time. <laughs> During this period, boy. Yep. Get me a mic, Stan. Yeah. It won't happen. Yes, it will. We're trying to get you involved. During this period, uh, third-party developers emerged and Atari at the time didn't appreciate the special talent it took to design and program games. They were treated like software engineers and weren't usually credited or given royalties for their work. Bit of a dog move. Seems pretty typical for the time. Yeah. This led to, and if you've seen Ready Player One, you'll know this. Yeah. I mean, why would I assume you've seen Ready Player One? Of course I've seen Ready Player One. Have you? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm a film connoisseur. Sure. <laughs> so it led to Warren Robinette to secretly program his name into Adventure, creating the first ever Easter egg. Okay. It's explained yep. like right at the start of the movie. Yep. Atari's policy also led to four of the company's programmers, David Crane, Larry Kaplan, Alan Miller, and Bob Whitehead, to resign from their, to resign and form their own company in 1979. And that company is called Activision. Oh. Come many at- of you would know Activision from Call of Duty. Tony yes. Hawk's Pro Skater. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, mm-hmm. Crash Bandicoot. Road Rage 3D. Yeah. Activision made Crash Bandicoot. Thought Naughty Dog made Crash Bandicoot. Naughty uh, Dog made Crash Bandicoot. They did, but at the time they were owned by Activision. Look it up. All right. Sure. Some other popular Activision games. Well, nowadays it's Activision Blizzard, so um, like Warcraft and mm. World of Warcraft and Diablo will come under that title. Overwatch will come under Activision's big, big um, company. umbrella. Activision have published Crash Bandicoot from 2008 until the present day. Uh, so they didn't create it, actually. Um, oh, well, they were a publisher, but it's- um, I think you'll find the first Crash Bandicoot um, came out a lot earlier than 2008. Boy. Developed by okay. Naughty Dog as an exclusive for Sony's PlayStation consoles. Numerous installments created by various developers. The series consistently predominantly in platform games. Spin-offs, yada, yada, yada. Originally produced by Universal Interactive, which later became known as Vivendi Games. What a great word. Vivendi Games. Vivendi. Vivendi. Ven- Vivendi merged with Activision, which currently owns and publishes the franchise. Thank you, Sean. So come 82, Atari's dominance was challenged by Colco's ColocoVision. As mm. I, I'm guessing it turned out well for them. Uh, that's a pretty well-known console. Is it? As just the same as Atari had done with Space Invaders, Colco developed a home version of Nintendo's arcade hit Donkey Kong and bundled it in with the console. Donkey Kong. Which was also the first appearance of everyone's favourite Mario. Mario. Man, did it have some serious memory. One kilobyte of scratch pad RAM. Wow. 16 kilobytes of video RAM. Wow. Eight kilobytes of read-only memory. I never actually went into like specs of any of these consoles. Yeah. It's not going to mean anything to most people. I just feel like it's too in the weeds, but it's very interesting to hear. It's quite a funny looking console. So The uh, Colco Vision. Colco Vision, yeah. yeah. So oh, they're all weird looking. It's a classic one with a number pad. I know that I'm, I'm miming things again to a podcast audience, but basically- Number the, pad with a dial? Yeah, it's a number pad with a dial. That's and what it's they on, had. And it's on the console and the only controller that comes off on a coiled wire, which is also a number pad and a dial. There you go. Mm. So yeah, Colco is challenging Atari's dominance. Um, they even sold a add-on that would allow the Colco Vision to play Atari 2600 games. Ooh. Could you imagine if that happened today? If like- You could just put a Sony PlayStation game into a Microsoft Yeah, if Xbox. Microsoft just went, here, buy this thing that plugs into USB drive and allows you to play PS5 games. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Could you imagine the shit fight that would cause? Yeah, it'd be on Kickstarter and oh. everyone would be like, that's going to yeah. be a game changer. And then the lawyers would crush it and everybody would be like, oh, oppression of no, no. the system. No, I paid $600 for this and I, I never got I, it. I get what you're saying, but- Take out the Kickstarter thing. Yeah. If Microsoft brought it out Just as an accessory, yeah. yeah, that's what's happening here. <laughs> like, uh, Nintendo are making the Rumble Pack, and uh, Microsoft are like, nah, let's just make things that play everybody else's yeah. game. <laughs> Polo, calm down, or I'll put beer in your water bowl. That won't help. Cut that. <laughs> Don't just move further. <laughs> <away. Cheeky>, Cheetah <laughs> Cheeky- <laughs> says no to animal abuse. <laughs> Cheek Tail says, no, thank you. Dale. He's such a little jerk. You know what he started doing now? Every morning when I get up, I go in and like go to the bathroom, like wash my face off or whatever. He just comes in. I'm going to take a piece. 
But now he started just every so often, he'll just not go in the litter. He'll just like piss in the bathtub. And nice. so then I've got to clean just it up first thing uh, in the yeah. morning. Yeah, absolutely. That's asserting dominance. Power yeah. move. Big power move. Maybe I'll just piss in the bathtub myself, show him who's boss. Bet you call- he says your name wrong to other cats too. <laughs> oh, that's my owner. Oh, yeah, Adam. Oh, no, sorry, Aaron. <laughs> That's my owner, A.A. Ron. <laughs> hey, even, <boo. laughs> even still, uh, Colco only had 70% of the market share compared to Atari's 58%. So, 17? Yeah, yes. 17. Okay. Sure sounded like 70. No, 17. Activision, though, was, was, it was a success as a third-party developer, and it inspired other third-party developers to emerge in the early 1980s. And by 83, at least 100 other companies claimed to be making software for the Atari and Atari... They had dollar signs in their eyes. But in saying that, it was only 10% of games that were making 75% of sales. So there were some questions about quality. Yeah. Well, yeah. While Activision was founded by ex-game developers from Atari, a lot of these new startups were backed by venture capitalists looking to cash in on a booming market. As a result, the Atari 2600 market became watered down and retailers would discount these low-quality games, which affected the good games, as well as consumers would buy the cheaper games. And not the regular priced good ones. Yeah. And here is the crash that we've been waiting for. <laughs> we're, still, we're still in like early history of video games. And here we're now in 1983 and the crash. Well, I, it's- I know a bit about this. Yeah. So I'm interested to hear. While in some way, I've got to talk through it just so you can keep it in because it's hilarious. Stop scratching the damn door. <laughs> <laughs> While in some way, there's one particular game that cops it for causing the crash. And it was actually several like different factors that caused it. Mm. One of those factors is what I just foreshadowed in the lead up. Oversaturation. Yep. Heaps of developers making whatever they wanted with almost no quality control. Multiple consoles available to purchase, and one source even stated that Cubit, we were looking up before, it was available to be purchased on nine different consoles. Wow. And it wasn't just third parties either. Atari was doing it to themselves. Yeah. They were overconfident. Pac Man. Just released this absolute garbage. Yeah. Pac Man that I mentioned earlier, huge arcade hit. Mm. And so was Miss Pac Man, by the way. Ms. 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 Pac Man. And it was a highly anticipated to come to home consoles as well. And it did, but it was rushed and it was widely criticized for being a poor port of the arcade version. Atari had ordered 12 million copies of the game to be made. At that time, only 10 million 2600s had been sold at the point. Oh, so they ordered more copies of the game than consoles consoles. existed. Their thinking was that every 2600 owner would buy Pac-Man and then the game would push another 2 million sales of the console. Jeez, that's a bold, bold choice. In the end, Pac-Man would sell around 7 million copies. Not an awful Ooh. result, but well short of their estimates. 7 million plastic cartridges. Yep. That will take, what, 300 but million don't years. don't forget, 5 million never even used. Yep. Uh, and a lot. Uh, well, I did see, not a lot, but like, I, there wasn't a percentage or numbers, but they were getting returned as well because of the poor, poor of quality. Like, poor quality yeah. of it. Yep. Another financial misstep was the movie tie-in game, E.T. Mm. E.T. Phone Home. This is the game that seems to take the brunt for almost killing the video game industry. There's multiple documentaries just about this game Mm, and how it caused this. I watched one on a plane once even. Yeah. Yeah. I do mention the documentary later on. I name it. Uh, Atari bought the property rights. And that cost them $25 million. They then wanted to have the game out by Christmas that season. Mm. That left only six weeks development time. And it skipped quality testing. Does that sound familiar? Mm. Six weeks. Atari shipped about 4 million copies of the game to retailers. And well, about 3.5 million were returned to Atari. The game was bad. Had little relevance to the movie. And it was meant to, like it was, as it was meant to tie in. And for some reason it was, Fairly difficult, with E.T. falling consistently into house size holes while searching for pieces of a phone. There was also supposedly a bug that if E.T. wasn't exactly in the middle of the hole when he tried to climb out, he would just fall straight back down. Again, this game wasn't the cause. It was more like the straw that broke the camel's back. It, From what I've seen, 
it was bad, but it was destined to fail from the beginning because of everything else that was going on. The documentary that I mentioned later and that Sean just brought up, um, like, like I said, I say it later, it was, oh, it's in this next paragraph. Just get to the bit. Yeah, it's in, the, it's in the next paragraph. ET wasn't the only game sent back with consumer confidence at an all time low. Retailers with abundance of games and consoles taking up room in their shops and no one buying them. Retailers were forced to send stock back to the manufacturers. And what did they do with them? They dumped them in a landfill site in New Mexico. Threw them in the garbage. Microsoft's Xbox team actually did a documentary in 2014 and excavated the site in search of the dumped products. The doco is called Atari Game Over. Just so if you want to go look it up and watch it. I have seen it. It it is a good documentary, but it kind of ends with just a lot of questions. Um, It's actually really funny because I watched... Little snip. I've actually seen the whole thing, but I watched a little snip of it, snippets of it today as they went searching for it. There's a lot of people praising uh, the developer of ET, Sean. If you can look that up, please. Saying that what he actually made in they say five weeks in the documentary has to be credited, like to actually make something in five teams, and it's a single person that made it. it wasn't a yeah. team of how, hundreds of people. Yeah, how it's got Warshaw. Yeah, um, and a lot of people in the industry today are just like, yeah, what he actually made. Like it was not that bad. There are worse games out there. I'm assuming they are, but it just seems to cop. Yeah, but this could also be it. like that rose tinted glasses thing where yeah. people are like, oh, actually, um, if you uh really uh care about the gaming industry, it's pretty good, actually. Um yeah. Sean, can you please look up um, Kind of like Avatar. Seamus Seamus? Seamus <laughs> Seamus uh oh, what's his last name? Blackley or something like that. He was like one of the original engineers on Xbox, like the first Xbox. I think that's him. So one of the first engineers on Xbox, he's in this documentary talking about it. And he is saying <laughs> in the documentary, I thought it was really funny. He's saying, I'd rather play that ET game than go play a Call of Duty game. And I find oh, that- nah, mate. And I find that really funny now because uh, Microsoft is still like going through- the FTC to buy Activision Blizzard, which yeah. would then they would own Call of Duty. So it just, I just find that really funny it's, considering what's happening it, at the moment. It's just Here's exactly all. what I'm talking about. People <laughs> just being like, no, nah, actually, um, it's not that bad. Actually, it's the greatest game of all time. Uh, and it just wasn't appreciated by the people at the time because they were so stupid. You know, these days, you know, if that game was released today, everyone would love it. It was just ahead of its time. You know, ET was the best game of all time. That kind of crap. Let him go. Seamus Blackley is also the guy famous for saying gaming is like masturbation. Everybody no. does it. Nobody wants to talk about it. <laughs> I did not know he said that. In 2001. He he's said a he pretty funny got, bloke. He said he nearly got fired. Yeah. yeah. I, I've heard him on a couple of podcasts. He's he's pretty like funny with some of the things he says like that. Sounds like one of those guys that just says everything that comes into his head. Yeah. Another factor that caused the crash was that home computers, ones like the Commodore 64 and the Apple II, were becoming more affordable. And they were also able to play games, some and like more advanced games. Games. Like one game to be considered the first open world and sandbox game, the space trading and combat simulation, Elite. Oh, I like Elite Dangerous. Yeah, I chucked that one in just for you, boy. <laughs> Elite Dangerous, the great space sim of 2015, I want to say. Well, this, is, this is the first one. I think it was in 83. It was called Elite. Yeah. Elite's the original. Then they yeah. released a sequel called Elite Dangerous. Yeah. And then they released the new Elite Dangerous, which was yeah, about 2013 or something mm. like that. You can be a space trucker or a space cowboy or- Space bounty hunter. Yeah. Because whatever you can do, or space market player, whatever you can do in the real world, you can just do it in space. Mm. Go Space Broncos. <laughs> <laughs> they also said- these new home computers would prepare you for a job. Well, that was their marketing spin on it anyway. Sure. So while the console makers were absorbing the hit of the crash, home computers were in people's homes with the next generation of game coders learning the tricks of the trade. Mm. So what saved an industry that was valued at $3 billion in 1983 and crashed to roughly $100 million in 1985? Call of Duty. So like I said, they lost 90%. So they went from $3 billion industry to $100 million. Like- Mm. Well, during the downturn, arcade machines in bowling alleys, coin-operated arcades, variety shops, and shopping malls helped the market cling to life. And it was the arcade market that revitalized in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, thanks to some hits like Double Dragon, Street Fighter 2, and Mortal Kombat. Uh That's considered to be 
I think the golden age of mm. arcade. Does that come in? Couple of bangers. Couple of bangers. Also, a little known company known as Nintendo helped out by releasing the Family Computer, or Famicom for short, in Japan. Even though the market in the US was in tatters, Japan's market was relatively unscathed and thus was a success in Japan selling 2.5 million consoles by the start of 1985. They then wanted to introduce the system to the US but were wary of the US market as it was still recovering and video games still had a negative reputation. Therefore, they redesigned the Famicom to the Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES for short. The idea is they wanted it to look like a high-end tech device like a VCR. Instead of a toy, it looks exactly it looks like exactly that. Like a VCR. Yeah, yeah. And if you haven't seen an NES before, you absolutely one hundred percent have seen the color scheme. Yes, the like black with a white outline with the red yep. buttons. You've seen that. That's how ubiquitous it became. Have you got a picture of the Famicom? Like all these consoles we've been talking before, they look, they were colored and they look like mm. toys. The Famicom. Whoa! Models. I'm not talking about holy the, crap. I'm not talking about the Super Nintendo Famicom. Yeah, you're talking about the Famicom, yeah. the original Famicom. Wow. <laughs> That's cool, mate. Eh? Wow. Yeah, how much do you reckon one of them are worth now? I've got no idea. Depends on how much those colours stayed intact. Yeah, That's you could impressive. retrobrite that. Even the Super Nintendo Famicom's you cool. Can, you can put the controllers on the Famicom. Yeah. They clip into the sides. They have their own dock. One of the other things with uh, like the NES was famous, famous for was its light gun. Yeah, and having the least ergonomic controller ever made. Yeah. The NES. Yeah. Yeah, because it's like yeah, eh. it's just perfect rectangle with flat buttons. Yeah, you know the the light gun. Mm. Nintendo actually made like a light gun in the sixties for something else, um, and then they've just seemed to manage to get it to work with their, the their NES. Console. The NES Zapper, also yeah. known as the video game shooting series light gun, um, is an electronic light gun accessories for the NES. Yeah, for, mm. the NES is so popular, or was so popular. I'm there is a it. Lego set for it. Now. I'm going to get to it. Yeah, the Lego set's cool. Yeah. So that strategy of making it look like a VCR, it worked. It rejuvenated the US video game market by, and by 1989, the market had resurged to $5 billion. Over 35 million NES systems were sold in the US throughout its lifetime with nearly 65 million systems sold globally. Yeah. And why not? The NES introduced some banger games like Super Mario Brothers, The Legend of Zelda. It's a me, Luigi, the other Mario. Metroid, mm. Final Fantasy, and one for Sean, Metal Gear. Mm-hmm. Second favorite video game series of all time. And the video game industry from there has just got bigger and bigger, now being the largest entertainment industry currently valued at $197 billion. Just for comparison, movies are valued at $122.4 billion, music is at $25.9 billion, and books, boy, you want to take a stab at what books are at? 25 bucks and a half eaten sausage roll. 138 billion. That's more than I expected. Say print media. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> Cheeky Tail says, please. That's worth more than the movie industry. Yeah, the Books are up there. Just like, I, if you're still at this point in the episode and you're thinking to yourself, eh, how are they worth so much? It, this includes like mobile games. Oh, yeah. If you've oh, ever yeah. played can- yeah, Candy Crush, you're a video gamer. Yeah. Yeah. If you've ever played Farmville, you're a video gamer. Like, you don't even realise how often you play a game. Every little simple video game that you download for your kids to keep them occupied, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. gaming. Yep. And so, obviously, like, we've got the huge hitters mentioned before, GTA V. Um, that had that made some records when it came out. Uh, its first day, it sold 11.2 million copies, and it was the fastest, like, property to reach a billion dollars in only three days. Did mm-hmm. you get it at the midnight launch, Sean? GTA 5. Yeah. I did not. <laughs> okay. So two of us went to a midnight launch to get it. Yep. And uh, uh, we were with another friend. Mm. Cheesy. I thought you were going to tell the story of I immediately opened it to pull the map out and immediately ripped the map that came oh, with the book. <laughs> yeah. That's a very Sean story. That sounds like something I would do. John, he opens it and goes, oh, a map. And rips it. Rips it right along the fold. <laughs> and Actually, like I, I've done that. And like I mentioned before, like- a part of that 100 or two two billion dollars. A part of that two billion dollars at the moment, like Microsoft is currently, Activision Blizzard have agreed to it. They're just trying to get it through, like FTC and the European Market Watchdog, whatever it is. Everyone's okay with it. There's only one company that has a problem with it, and you can probably guess what company it is. Sony. 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 This is very inside baseball. Yeah, it is. 
Uh, yeah, Microsoft is currently trying to buy Activision Blizzard for sixty nine point four billion dollars. Nice. Well, they've already bought. They already bought Bethesda. They've yeah, bought, they bought. They bought Bethesda for seven billion. Yeah, something along those lines. Seven billion dollars, which was a lot at the time. And then they just go out and go, "Yeah, we want Activision Blizzard too." Here's seventy billion. Mm-hmm. But they're buying. They're buying stuff like Candy Crush, yeah. Call of Duty, mm-hmm. um, and it's really Sony's only issue is Call of Duty. They really don't care about anything else. Mm. Well, that's a story. As a story, I'm sorry if it got a bit boring or whatever, but like I said, I'm a bit of a gamer. I actually found the history of it interesting. I, I didn't know any of that, like that pre crash stuff. Yeah, I didn't stuff. know pre Pong. Yeah. Yeah. It was super interesting. And just, I, and I know there was a lot of numbers in there. I actually found that super interesting too, just watching how much money it was making. I didn't realize how such quickly, sh- like, you think about how quickly it went from. You know, sort of existing to massive, massive to billion industry, dollar industry to, like, to back to, to double a, yeah. to double any sale in a year. Yeah. Even if you are doubling a couple of hundred to bucks, to tr- yeah. doubling and quadrupling anything, yeah, is nuts. Mm. Like that's so much. Yeah, uh, yeah, but- that's that's video games. Like Sean, you said your second favorite uh, franchise of all times, Metal Gear. It is absolutely. What's yours, boy? Do you have one? Well, I'm a. We're actually three very different people in terms of gaming. I yeah. am a racing game enthusiast mm-hmm. um, and also love Fallout. Yeah, nice. I'm a big single player story and adventure player. Mm-hmm. I appreciate online games, but I've never really enjoyed them that much, especially if I'm not playing with somebody I know. I will not get- Story driven is best for is me best, as well. Yeah. yeah. I do enjoy- Fallout games, not as, as much as you, but yeah, Kingdom Hearts and Metal Gear Solid are my two favorite series of all time by a large margin. Both of them have bafflingly insane stories, and I, I guess I kind of like that. And the gameplay keeps up with the way I like it. For instance, everyone goes, oh, if you like story-based games, you're like this. I don't like turn-based gameplay, except yeah. Pokemon, but that's its own <laughs> thing, right? So, I, you know, I've never really gotten to JRPGs. Can we talk about the history of gaming without talking about Pokemon? I never brought up Pokemon, no. Yeah. Yeah. That's my style. Well, for, for me, um, I'm going to have to, I'll have to say Halo is probably my number one huge ha- like Halo Damn, fan. Okay. John's a real bro gamer. Yeah. I, I appreciate Halo for how, what it did for video game history as a whole, but I just, every time I try to get into it, I just can't. I, again, I wouldn't say it's probably the best game I've ever played, but it's probably my favorite franchise. Oh, Okay. Best game you've ever played and favorite game you've ever played. They, they can be two different things. Mm. Yeah. Uh, probably the best game I've ever played. It's either going to be The Last of Us or God of War. Mm-hmm. And, like the and, 2014 remake God of War. And then favorite is Halo. Uh, just I'm going to say Halo 2 just because I spent a lot of time in the multiplayer after school and stuff like that. Like, I mean, like thousands of multiplayer games. Yeah, damn. I honestly can't name my favorite game right now. I think the last game that I couldn't put down, I can't even remember. Hogwarts Legacy, probably. Fall yeah. Guys. In 10 years' time, what are you going to be? In 10 years' time, I say, hey, look, I've got all the old games we used to play when we were younger. What do you want to play? Honestly, I want to go back to playing Call of Duty 4 on LAN in my parents' living room. Because mm-hmm. that was like, it was multiplayer, but you were together. And it was really simple gameplay that you could just do over and over again. You know, you'd be like, oh, you killed me. Back into it. And he called me a bro gamer and he's picked Call of Duty. <laughs> I enjoyed I enjoyed playing Call of Duty 1 on, on LAN in your yeah. in your parents' yeah. house and the, the paintball mods and yeah. things like that. Oh, that was, that was Call of Duty 4 with the paintball mod, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Favorite game versus favorite game would be probably Metal Gear Solid 3. And the best game I've ever played is... Zelda Breath of the Wild. Oh, yeah. Good I, choice. I just think that is the best damn. It's the most well-rounded, perfect game I've ever played. It's not my favorite because it, it doesn't tick all the, all the boxes. But in terms of the best game ever, it's just, I can't find any real fault. That's, that's probably why I went with God of War because it has a great story mm. and, a, and a personal story of a father and a son. The mechanics of it's like the combat in it's so good. Like being able to do it. Basic buttons, but you can do a very um, deep combat system with combos and stuff. Mm. We're getting real in the oh, weeds no. here. Let's wrap this up. But, sure. it, but like the the weeds that we get into. And this is something yeah. that we know. Uh, this is kind of why I wanted mm, to do it. Uh, once again, specific to each person. Zelda Breath of the Wild ticks my boxes because you know of the what? insane I've just music. Of it. Gran Turismo 4. Gran Turismo really? 4. Yeah. That what? is peak not, gaming, not a in my opinion. 
No, four no, sucks. Four's a, to Gran, Turismo yeah, four. Gran Turismo four. It was the peak of the mountain. It might have been limiting even at the time in terms of how many cars you could race at once. Yeah, but and the no damage thing, and yeah, like there was yeah. things about it, but that game is so complete compared to any other racing game I've played. <sighs> it had force feedback, wheel support. Mm-hmm. I tell you, a racing game I did spend a lot of time in. Mm. Horizon. Colin McRae. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. They had, were bone crushingly hard. I game. had that on yep. the original PlayStation with yeah. a wheel on a little 13 mm-hmm. inch CRT monitor. Yep. And I was decent. Mm. Mm. My first video game experience was a PlayStation 1. My parents bought, of course, I was living in New- When the Nintendo yep. 64 came out, I was living in New Zealand. So we didn't, we didn't get it. We got a PlayStation 1. And I got Crash Bandicoot 2. Yep. My brother got Disney's Hercules. Oh, that was good. And my yeah. father got Colin McRae Rally, the first one. Mm. And my mum got Road Rash 3D. Nice. I'm going to age myself here. Go oh, for here it. We go. First console I played was the Atari 2600. Wow. Oh, okay. <laughs> you old man. My family got one. And I remember playing games. I remember playing like Space Invaders. I remember playing Berserk. And like all those old Atari yeah. games. Mine might have been on Windows PC. And yeah. then Windows 95. Well, yeah. So a lot of it comes from if your parents had consoles yeah. before you were around, right? Lived in the sticks. My parents and didn't know what they were. My first console was the Seagull Master System. Oh, okay. And then I got a Mega Drive. And then, yeah, the family got a PlayStation. And then I got a PlayStation 2. So mm. pretty much had nearly every generation of console apart from those first Pong con- consoles. Yeah. Pong souls. Consoles. I remember my PlayStation 2 at Christmas. Yep. I remember, I remember getting mine. 2000 and what, maybe four. Wouldn't have been 2003 because my parents. And if anyone's ever yeah. played a cartridge based game like System, blowing in the thing does not actually do anything. Don't do that. <laughs> it's the cartridge noise. It doesn't, it doesn't actually do anything. No, it can't. No. It physically can't do no. anything, but it's funny. Yeah. What actually does something is the fact that you pull it out and put it back in. Yeah. It's like yeah. scratching, the, scratching the surface of the, it. Yeah. Um, contacts. Anyway, we've dribbled on for about an extra 10 minutes. <laughs> but these are good little bits. So thanks for listening. Thanks for us reminiscing on our old video games. We hope that you have your favorite game. Get on those socials and tell us- Tell us your favorite you Tell us your favorite and, and possibly the best game you've ever played. Don't think that saying any game is going to be judged. Because yeah. if you love Candy Crush, great. Yeah. If your favorite game ever is the mobile adaption of PUBG, oh. then- that's what it is, you know. It's, it's, it doesn't have to be the best game the, ever. The, the game if it's I'm, Clash of Clans, though, I will attack you'll you judge mercilessly. You. Yeah. The it, game I'm playing the most at the moment is probably Marvel Snap. Actually, Marvel Snap. Wow. It's chess.com for me. Which is just a, a mobile game. But yeah, we, get on We get have on the a socials. yearly Mario Kart comp in the office that's running right now. Yeah, yeah. Nice. And there's a group of absolute nerds playing Clash of Clans together. As they're all allowed in our footy tipping contest, I would like to attend on Tuesday when we have lunch <laughs> together. I would like to throw my hat in the ring. Nah, it's, a, it's an elimination tournament. It takes two months. So I have no idea what photos I'm going to put in for the uh, socials. Probably the uh, NES Famicom or... Um, the Famicom console. Oh, yeah. the early, the yeah. original Famicom. It's you a show, sight. You got to show one of the Pong Souls. Looks yeah. like Pong Souls. Well, probably, pro- I'll probably do, what was the first uh, console? The Odyssey. Yep. They'll probably be on there. Magnavox. Um, anyway, go take a look at Cheeky Tales on uh, Facebook, it'll be Instagram there, yep. and Twitter. Um, so thanks for listening. Like I said, this is a topic that I've been wanting to do because I like games. Games. Um, games. Probably my favorite to- form of media. So, Thanks for sticking with us. If you don't like them, eh, it's not for you. Yeah. Wait Uh, till next week. It happens. Back to a disaster. (laughs) (laughs) All right. We will see you in two weeks. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Good night.